So I don't have a bumper. I don't have a branding. I don't have anything like that. I just am going to come right down here where you are. First time I've been down here. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. We've gone from pulpits to tables and notes to iPads. And, and uh, that's pretty good for a guy who 10 years ago couldn't cut a computer on. And um, I was always scared of computer. I was scared I was going to hit a button and the world was going to blow up or something. I didn't, I didn't know that much about them. <coughs> Holy Spirit, I ask you just to, that thing you did Friday night, God, in Houston, that you told me is supposed to happen here today. <coughs> Do it, God. Do it. We're not in a hurry we don't have multiple services yet. There's not a group outside waiting to get in. We're not going to be rushed. We're going to take our time. And we're going to receive this word that you're about to give. So I ask that you give me the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation. And the knowledge of you and the knowledge of your will. And I pray that everybody in this building, that the eyes of their understanding be enlightened. In the name of Jesus. We give you these next few moments and I pray that they be life-changing and precious. We say that in Jesus' name and everybody said amen, amen, and amen. Tell your neighbor, say here we go, neighbor, here we go, here we go. <clears throat> I'm going to Mark chapter 4. When we opened this new form of redemption here, I didn't know I didn't know what to expect. Guys, that lighting's pretty good. I don't know what you did since last night. That's not bad. I thought it'd be a lot dimmer than that. I didn't know what to expect. I just knew it was going to be different. I knew it was not going to be a nostalgic regathering of an old thing, but something that's birthed fresh and new. And in that, it has brought a lot of new people there are not just some familiar faces in this room. There are a ton of unfamiliar faces in this room. We're grateful for that. Amen. The most exciting part of the hospital is the baby ward. It's where the babies are being born. It's where new life comes in. So we know people getting saved and people that are visiting. That makes things exciting and lively. And we, we're grateful for that. I have sensed somewhat here, can, may I be honest and vulnerable for a moment, that I can just sense when there's something that's supposed to be happening that ain't happening yet. Sometimes I can't even define what that thing is. I just know there's a missing piece. I spent hours in prayer last night because I felt a convergence coming together. Something coming together that was finally going to make it click. And then favor and multiplication and acceleration breaks out. And that stuff happens that only God can do. We can't do it. Because one seeds, one waters, but only God can give increase. So increase is a godly thing. It's not a man thing. We can seed and we can water. We can talk about it and we can serve. And, but if it's going to bring, be, if it's going to increase, God has to do it. And so there's some dynamics that are long-term dynamics to what's called, everything called redemption and who me and hope are. And it's a kingdom message. And I know that probably half the people in this building were not a part of what we did here previously. And so maybe you're not used to that stream. You're not used to that thread. You got to understand, I've had years and years and years of kingdom teaching. Those who have been with me for years can probably parrot it back to me. Uh, but what I am finding out is that there's a whole generation that are biblically illiterate to the kingdom message. I'm getting asked to come to the biggest churches in America that have never even said the word and they're asking me teach it. I was in a room preaching a while back and I went back there after the service. We had a great service and I went and they had a long table, a little like the marriage supper of the lamb picture. And they had a long table, had 22 pastors sitting around the table and they gave me a plate of food and they said, teach us the kingdom. And I sat there two and a half hours while pastors wept who had never heard it. So I want to take, it's not going to be 30 minutes, probably about 40 to 45. I'm not going to get in a hurry. Come on now. 
and I just want to break some things down to you and I want you to shout if you want to you can run this is a big building you can run all the way down them exhibition halls get you a sprite and come back in here hallelujah whatever you got to do let's have some fun because this message is so powerful it's hard to contain yourself okay keep playing if you would just just a moment Gerald I'm gonna go to mark 4 <coughs> There are two realms. And we talk a lot about the spiritual, the supernatural, and, and all those things, but I'm just going to be honest with you. We see very, very, very little of it. Very little of it. There are things that we have to go to counseling for six months that God could do in a moment. There are things that God could do in an instant where we've been medicated for 10 years. I believe God can break depression with one crying out to God. I believe that God wants to take churches and create atmospheres where while we're praising and while we're worshiping, stuff is breaking out everywhere. And we don't all get to testify of what God done because over here, a blind eye's popping open. Over here, suicide's being broken. And over here, depression's being crushed. And over here, a marriage is being put back together. And up the aisle comes somebody that's just been addicted to drugs and wants to get that word. Stuff just breaking out everywhere. We want it to be controlled, but sometimes real moves are messy. Real moves of God are not clean, they're messy. And I'm all about a polished, excellent representation of Jesus. But I'm not about it at the expense of losing the raw power of God moving amongst the people in a building. And if this is a strange sound to you, open your heart to what I'm about to say today. There are two realms. There is a spirit realm and there is a natural realm. And 2 Corinthians 4 and 18, I'm going to get to Mark 4 in just a minute. Just roll with me. It says, while we do not look at the things which are seen, how do, you, how do you do that? But the things which are unseen. So, so you're telling me the thing I can see, don't look at it. And you're telling me the thing that I can't see to stare right at it. How do you even do that? It doesn't make sense. That's a contradictory statement in itself. While we don't look at what we can look at, I want you to look at totally what you can't look at. Meaning that God created the heavens and the earth and God never intended for earth to operate without heaven. He intended heaven and earth to operate the same. And earth was to be a physical expression of heaven. That's why the first place was called Eden, perfection or heavenly. Because it was a physical expression of heaven. Adam was a physical expression, this may bother you theologically, of God. He breathed his own life into mud. Adam wasn't mud. Adam was the life that was breathed into the mud. And it was the life of God. Because you can't get life out of dirt. You only get life out of God. In him is life. And that life was the light of me. Oh, hallelujah. Do you see what I'm talking about? Adam was put here to govern the earth and cause it to operate like heaven. How did God operate? God said, and it was so. God said, and it was so. God said, and it was so. So here comes Adam, and the Bible says, and whatever he called it, that's what it was. Whatever he called it, that's what it was. Whatever Adam operated in a world that was like the one his father lived in, and he operated and functioned in the same way that his father did until he lost his authority to govern because he rebelled against God and he sinned. The whole story of Jesus is not a story about who owns the earth. It's the story of who will rule it. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Ownership has never been and will never be in question. But the cataclysmic event of the cross is one kingdom overtaking another. Jesus was not a religious figure. He was a political figure. He was a king. Jesus did not bring a religion to earth. He brought a kingdom to earth. Listen, this is very important. 
So when you say the word kingdom, this is what most people think. They think the church is the people locally and the kingdom is the people internationally. That's not the kingdom. The kingdom is a life that you can step through Jesus who is the door. And then this whole world which comes from another realm is available to you. In other words, the world that you can see, smell, taste, hear, and touch, I can sit here, this table right here, I can smack it. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that this right here is not real. For the Bible says the things which were seen were made out of things which are not seen. And the things which are seen, catch me now, is temporary. And the thing which you cannot see is eternal. So there is a realm that is a spirit realm. It is unchanging, it is immovable, and it is more real than the chair that is holding you up. And everything that you can see, smell, taste, touch, and feel came out of that realm. Adam lost access to that realm. Jesus came and opened the heavens back up and gave us access. How did he give us access? He gave us keys. Keys. Jesus took the keys of death, hell, and the grave when he descended into the depths. And then when he rose again, he said, all authority has been given unto me. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. You can tread on serpents and scorpions, that's demonic powers, in all the power of the enemy. He said, nothing can by any means harm you if you understand what just happened. It's not just about getting saved. A whole new dimension spiritually has been opened up for your access on a daily basis, not in church, on a daily basis. So let me describe that for you. A few more minutes in Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Gerald, for being so faithful to play. Now, can I just talk? Have y'all got any amens left in you? Okay. So, in other words, don't look at what you can see. Look at what you can't see. I have, I'll be 53 in a week. I can't believe that. I really can't. I'll be 53 in a week. And I have about figured out that what's going on is never really what's going on. I'm sorry I didn't know that when I was 23. Because I would see something and let it move me. I would let it affect me. I would let it determine my emotions. I would let it drive my responses. But then I'm realizing that that's not the place where my focus is supposed to be. There is an invisible realm. Invisible has nothing to do with the object. It has to do with the subject. You are the subject. Invisible means not that the object cannot be seen. It means that your eye cannot perceive the image. There is an entire realm that starts six inches above your head. And the Bible says that that realm is where all of your blessings are. For he has blessed you with every spiritual blessing. Catch this. In heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So in that realm, I don't have any needs. If I pass this microphone around, we'd be here till Thursday. Everybody telling us their needs. But in the spirit realm, I don't have any needs. That's why Jesus, when he was on the cross, said, it is finished. Some of you think heaven is walking through time with you. Some of you think God found out about your problem when you found out about it. Some of you pray like you're giving God information he doesn't have. Lord, do you know what they did to me? No, honey, tell me. I don't know. God is not walking through time with us. God is in eternity. And you got to understand in the spirit realm, everything is finished. So if you're praying in such a way where you're trying to get God upset about the thing that's upsetting you, he's not getting up. Jesus went back to heaven and read it. He sat down. 
He's not getting back up. He sat down. Sitting down is a posture of completion and rest. So Jesus on the cross said, it is finished. Everything that you'll ever need to be protected is yours. Everything you'll ever need to be provided is yours. Everything you need to reach your potential is yours. I've already put every answer to every question in place. I've already given you healing for every sickness. Come on, somebody. I've already given you deliverance for every bondage. There is nothing left to do. It is finished. Turn to two people and say, it's finished, it's finished. So when God looks at your life, he does not look at your life as a past, a present, and don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. God looks at your life as a finished canvas. That's why the steps of a good man are... (laughs) There's an order. Well, I feel like everything's out of order. No, there's an order. There's an order to the disorder. (laughs) Well, this pain can't be, no, there's an order to the pain. There's an order to your mistake. Because God wastes nothing. All things work together for the good of those that are gone. Not good things, all things. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, this say nothing is wasted, nothing is wasted. The good, the bad, the ugly, the in-between, none of it matters. It's all a part of a plan where God has ordered your steps. The Bible says that we were prepared for good. We are God's workmanship, prepared for good works that God created for us beforehand. The Bible says, cast all your care on him. That means anxiety. That means fear. And that word says he cares for you. Two different words for cares. It says you take this word care in the Greek and you cast anxiety, fear, and worry on him. And says why? Because you know he cares for you. That word care right there for God says that he anticipates a need. So in other words, you don't have to be afraid because God has already anticipated the thing that makes you afraid. God Almighty. God has already anticipated the answer you would need. God has already anticipated that you would be in this situation and he's already provided a breakthrough. Why? Because it is finished. (laughs) Well, I don't have any money. It is finished. Look at my home. It is finished. So I have got to learn how to apprehend the finished work and not live in this temporary. (laughs) Two different realms. We're totally focused on the wrong one. Let Let me give this to you with another analogy. Mary Magdalene is at the tomb and Jesus is gone. And she is profusely weeping. But there are two angels there. <clears throat> one at the place where Jesus' head lay, one at the place where his feet lay. Mary Magdalene is crying. I noticed something about six months ago in that text. The angels aren't crying. Mary's earthly. The angels are from the spirit realm. Mary's crying while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen. Because the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are unseen are eternal. Mary's crying, the angels aren't crying. That tells me the angels know something Mary doesn't know. So what's upsetting her is not upsetting them. Because the angels see everything from an it is finished perspective. All she knows is Jesus is gone. That's all she knows. So she's looking at the things which are seen, and she doesn't understand that there's an eternal purpose that is taking place. For the Bible says, had the ruler of this world known, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. Why? Because he descended into the depths of hell to the enemy and took into, went to the enemy's camp and took the keys out of his hand. All this was happening while he was gone from the tomb, but she couldn't see it. So here's what I've realized. <laughs> I was raised in a holiness church. My mama's here, so I can't talk bad about it. <laughs> you know, the holiness church, if it made you grin, it must be sin, that type thing. You know, if it was fun, it was wrong. <laughs> I never saw my dad in a pair of shorts, probably, when I was 25. 
If you ever went to youth camp, the girls and the boys had to go swimming on different days. Y'all don't know nothing about holiness. The men got to dress as fine and slick as they wanted to. The, the women couldn't wear makeup, couldn't wear jewelry, couldn't wear nothing flashy. Come in, my mom would pat me on the head, son, you gonna marry one of these nice little holiness girls in this church. I looked at mom and said, mom, I ain't. I ain't marrying nobody in this building. I'm just going to tell you that right now. Hope said she was raised holiness, but when I met her, she had a face full of makeup and big hair. She, I said, you ain't holiness. You, don't, you ain't even been holiness. I don't know that this was ever taught but this was what was learned from everything that was taught. <laughs> Is that you got saved by grace, but you stayed saved by living right. That becomes a very heavy taskmaster. <laughs> because you get to have your salvation dangled over you every day. Jesus came because people can't live right. <laughs> yeah, <that's> right. <laughs> he lived right because we couldn't, and I never understood. <laughs> well, I, I can only stay saved if I get everything right. So, you know, after I was about age 17, I realized I can't keep all these rules. So if I'm going to hell, might as well go in a limo. <laughs> you know. So anyway... As I grew, probably about my late 20s, I had some influences come in my life that changed my world. One Dr. Miles Monroe, and he started talking about the keys of the kingdom. I was very intrigued. Later on became my two decade long mentor and before he passed, gave me his personal notebook. I cherish it. And he made me realize that the commands of God, I, I want it to be quiet in here right now because I want you to get this. Because this is a shift for Bible Belt. The grace that saved you keeps you saved. And on your best day, you can't live good enough to be saved. And if you have a day where you do get most of it right, your Bible, the Bible says your, your righteousness is still filthy. So your very best day is filthy rags to God. So Jesus met a standard we could not meet. And when I accepted him as my savior, that standard is held irre ir irreverent of my conduct or behavior. Yeah, I knew I'd lose my amens right then. Because we want people to act a certain way if they get saved. That's why Jesus forbids you to judge. Because behind every action, there is a desire, and behind every desire, there's a need. And since you don't get to see desires and needs, you only get to see the action. God says, since you don't know the whole process, don't say nothing. <laughs> Whoo, I feel the Holy Ghost, I feel. Can I, keep, can I go deeper? Some of you want me to read some scripture. I'm, I'm quoting scripture left and right, come on. Okay, so these keys, when Jesus would say, love your neighbor as yourself, love your enemies, if someone strikes you, what he's doing is he's not giving you laws by which you make it into heaven. He's handing you keys that access it. Yeah. <laughs> Salvation allows you to go, Jesus said, I am the door. If I go to your house, please don't leave me at the door. Invite me in. But you know where most Christians are standing today? At the door. They got saved and that's all they know. We baptized them and threw them a t-shirt. That's all they know. The Holy Spirit's been totally written out of the script. I'm amazed at how many messages I hear on potential and, and purpose and the Holy Spirit's the only one who knows it. 
We preach on Jesus and we sing about the Father all the time, but they're the only two in heaven. The one that's in the earth, the Holy Spirit, we never sing about. We never talk about him. We never write about him. Nothing. He's been written out of the script. So you know what? We have an entire generation of people standing at the door waiting in ankle deep Christianity. I'm going to change that in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. So when he says tithe, tithe is not paying the church's bills. God was paying his bills for you ever got saved. God's been paying his bills for thousands of years. Respectfully, the church is going to go on whether you tithe or not. Because the tithe is not about it. It's about you. Bring me the tithe and see if I will not. So now there's this spiritual and this natural, stay with me, and there are access points where I can get that stuff and bring it here. Pray like this that my kingdom would come and my will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus says, I give you the keys. The keys to what? The kingdom. Earth was never meant to operate apart from heaven. So I'm giving you the keys that unlock heaven in your life. So when God <laughs> starts talking to husbands, husbands, those are keys. Yes. Ladies, those are keys. When he starts talking about your children, those are keys to heavenly children. Yes. Amen. When he starts talking about your money, don't get mad at the preacher. Why? Because heaven is inexhaustible. You're operating off limited funds. Heaven knows no, heaven does not know limitation. The spirit realm is inexhaustible. If God gave every one of you a billion dollars today, heaven would not be diminished one bit. Because you cannot exhaust it. So God's trying to give you the keys where you can have access to it, but people will not listen. <laughs> Our other campus out in the Silicon Valley, your brothers and your sisters, that's the tech world out there. Half of the Fortune 500 companies in all of America are within five minutes of our church building. Apple, Facebook, Google, Amazon, you name them. The richest people in the world, the whole world are out there. And they've got something. So many of our people are employed at the tech companies. Let me tell you what I found out. I've noticed something. They have this thing they have called benevity. It's a third party giving where you can give to your favorite nonprofit and the tech company will match it dollar for dollar. We just had a man last week tied $18,000 and Facebook matched it dollar for dollar and sent us a $36,000 check. <laughs> dollar for dollar. <laughs> and see, we're... We sit there and say, why does the world prosper and the church can't repair the roof? And we're God's people. It's because, let me tell you, a key doesn't care whether or not you're saved. Those doors right there, if those doors were locked, if I came up to that door, that door wouldn't say, wait a minute, are you born again filled with the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues? That door only cares about one thing. Do I have a key? That's all it cares about. So you know what I'm understanding? All these companies that are now the richest companies in the history of humanity. They got money going out left and right. They are givers. Much more than a tithe. They got so much money they don't know where to give it. And so they got people sit in their tens of thousands of employees and says, whatever you love and want to give to, we will match it. Because they understand a key and they keep growing and they keep going. What? Till there is a blessing that they don't have room to contain. Elon Musk, the head of Tesla, and Jeff Bezos, the head of Amazon, their children's 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 children will never be able to spend all their money. Because the promise when everybody tithe is a blessing that's so big you can't contain it. They're operating in it. But you preach on tithe in the church, people will sit right down on you. 
That's why Jesus said the children of the world are wiser than the children of light. <laughs> Keys. Access points. How do I get heaven in my house? Mark chapter 4. <laughs> I got about 15 scriptures. I need you to roll with me. Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. Are y'all in a hurry or can I finish? Can we finish up? I need everybody one time say, finish, preacher, finish. <laughs> okay. And it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it scorched and because it had no root, it withered away. Some seed fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on the ground, yielded a crop, sprang up, increased 30, 60, and 100 fold. Verse 9, he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. He already knows there are people that are going to turn him off. When you talk about seed time and harvest, you just automatically lose half your, half your listeners. He knew that. He said, so those of you that will hear me, I got something for you. The rest of you, you'll just have to work with what you got. But when he was alone, this is important right here. Those around him with the 12 asked him about the parable. And he said, to you, it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables. Keep reading. So that seeing they may, not, they may see and not perceive, hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all parables? Did you catch that? Jesus said, if you don't get what I'm about to say, nothing else I'm going to teach will mean anything. He said, this is ground floor kingdom. He's teaching a parable of the kingdom. Now, let me tell you what a parable is. It's a curtain. <coughs> Jesus is not giving a teaching on agriculture. He's using agriculture as a curtain. And then, seek ye first the kingdom of God. The seeker pulls back the curtain and sees the truth behind the story. The outside people, the casual, they just hear a story. But there's another group of people. Now, I know we don't like this. And in a day where more walls need to be broken down than ever before, I do have to say this. So I just read this already in the church. Jesus said it. We have an us and we have a them. <laughs> a them is everybody who's been saved. Why? Because... That is receiving. And everybody's a receiver. He said, they're on the outside. He didn't say they wouldn't, he didn't say they weren't a part of him. He said, they're on the peripheral. They're casual. Let me tell you what Jesus is saying. He's been sitting there teaching on the kingdom all day. He goes off to a set place by himself and they said, Jesus, why is it when you got a crowd you speak in code. But when you get with us by ourselves, you speak plainly. <laughs> Listen to Jesus, I love him. He said, because I don't want them to know. <laughs> he said, I spent all day hiding this behind a curtain. Because I'm not going to throw my pearls before swine. <laughs> he said, I'll tell you. He said, but I'm not going to tell them. He said, because the kingdom does not come to the casual, it comes to the seeker. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. All these things are in the kingdom. The kingdom is full of your blessings. The kingdom is inexhaustible. And when you seek first the keys of the kingdom, all these things will be added unto you. If I can ever get you to learn the kingdom, you'll quit praying about things. You have the key to the things. But we come up to the altar, Brother Gerald, and we say, I need you to pray for me. I need a financial breakthrough. <laughs> Respectfully, I'll pray for anybody. But prayer is not the seed for finances. It's not the key for it. I need you to come up here. I, I just need freedom from anxiety. I need some peace in my life. Would you pray for me? Yeah, but 
Prayer is not the key for peace. So you want all these things, but we ignore the keys. He's already told you how to have financial breakthrough. He's already told you how he will stop the seed eater. He's already told you how he will give access to heaven. Now it's up to you whether or not you're to use the key. He said, I will keep in perfect peace those whose mind has stayed on me. Yeah, I'll pray for you. But the fact is, whether or not you have peace is going to be how locked in your thought life is. It's not going to be whether or not I was anointed. It's going to be what you focus on. You focus on all your problems, all your failures, all your losses, everybody who's done you wrong, everything that ain't grown right. You grieve all the time. Every time you're alone, you cry. He says, you're not going to have any peace. Well, preacher, I want you to pray for me. Yep, you're going to have peace as long as I'm praying for you. Then you're going right back to like you were. But until you have your mind stayed on him and whatever is good, whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever is kind, whatever is true, think on these things. Lock your mind into another place and God will let all of your anxiety begin to settle down. It's not about my praying. It's about you using a key. Shout hallelujah. Can I keep going? I'm trying. Keys, keys, keys. Not staying saved. Keys. Man, I used to get saved 55 times a day. Because I thought every time I did something bad, I had to go start all over. <laughs> I remember I'd lay down in the bed scared at night, Lord, please forgive me. <laughs> if I fought anything, I'd just go through the list. Because they showed pictures of hell and they preached about hell all the time. And I didn't know nothing about heaven, but I knew I did not want to go to hell. <laughs> Let me go back to those verses, please. Now he's telling them plain. He says, come with me behind the curtain. I'm not going to give it to them. They're a bunch of takers. They come for the healing line. They come for the loaves and fishes. They come because they want something. But you, Matthew, you left your tax collection business. You, Luke, you left your doctor's practice. You, Peter, you gave up all your fishing boats. You that gave up something to be with me, I'll tell you. You guys left everything and followed me. You became a seeker. I'll give the kingdom to the seeker. I will not give it to the casual. The sower sows the word. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown when they hear. Satan comes immediately and takes away a word, the word that is sown in their hearts. These likewise, the one on stony ground, they hear the word immediately receive it with gladness. They have no root in themselves, and so they endure only for time. Afterward, in tribulation, persecution arises for the word's sake. Immediately stumble the next group. Now these are the ones among thorns. They're the ones who hear the word. And the cares of the world, deceitfulness of riches, the desires of other things choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. But these are the ones on good ground, you know, 30, 60, 100 fold. Let me stop right there. Most of the time I hear this preached, everybody's talking about those four kinds of people, four kinds of personalities. I've even preached, every time that I preach, I got a 25% of, percent chance of people entering the kingdom. According to that parable, that story, one out of every four of you are going to walk out here and get it according to that, unless all of you decide to become, a, to become a part of the us crowd. The kingdom crowd is the us crowd. The peripheral crowd is the them crowd. Jesus loves them all. But salvation is free. The kingdom is not. It is not. <clears throat> now, I want to take this. This is my last minute. I'm, I'm going to land this plane. I want to take this last point and drive home the seed and the soil. I don't want to talk about those four kinds of people. The seed and the soil. Listen now. What is a kingdom? Jesus came. The kingdom is an extension of rule. Jesus came and John the Baptist says, repent for the kingdom is at hand. In other words, heaven is about to once again enter the earth. God Almighty, that's powerful. 
The word repent does not mean go to the altar and pray a prayer. It means change your mindset. Change your mindset. You're no longer going to be limited to earthly things. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Man will once again access heavenly things. So Jesus comes along and says, this is ground floor kingdom. This is how you have access points and move things from one dimension to another. I got bombs going off in my head. I could preach four hours. I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to find which horse to saddle up right here and ride it. Because I, I mean, I got, I got everywhere. <laughs> Jesus said, the seed is the word of God. I believe in immediates, immediately's. I love it in the Bible, was it when it says, and suddenly. I love the word breakthrough. It just sounds good to even say it. Breakthrough. That's a good preaching word, breakthrough. Say it with a little bit of growl, or I have breakthrough. <laughs> and suddenly and immediately, quickly, I love them and they exist and I've experienced them, but they are not the story of my life. The story of my life is seed, time, harvest. Planting today what I desire in my future with my words, my actions, my thoughts, and my gifts. Amen. Where do I want to go? Cooperate with it now. Plant it. Access. He says, the seed is the word of God. Here's the problem. You're going to go to God and pray for the oak tree. And God's going to hand you an acorn. And you're going to be ticked off. What you don't understand is that God answered your prayer. Because if you knew what to do with the seed, the tree is in the acorn. God never hands you the 40-year-old mighty oak tree. He hands you the acorn and he says, work it. If I slid open an apple right here and pulled a seed out of it, should have done it. And I held that tiny seed in my hand. The fact is I'm holding a seed. But the fact by definition means the present condition of a thing. The fact is I'm holding a seed. Truth is I'm holding a tree. But the tree is in the seed. Ho, 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 ho. The truth is I'm holding a forest. <laughs> because the tree is in the seed. The fruit is in the tree. The seed is in the fruit. That is in the tree. That is in the fruit. That is in the seed. That is it. You remember when I talked about that? Or that? You got this cycle going? That's why God does not come down every springtime and plant tomatoes. He planted them one time and we're still eating it. One time. Genesis 1, he put every herb in the ground for food. And we're still eating it. Because of a seed. So God says, his word is seed. So if you say, Pastor, would you pray for me that I be healed? Sure, I will. And there are suddenlies in healing. Sure, we'll pray for you. But if God gives you a word on healing, you just got your healing. Because he packed the manifestation in the scripture. So when you read, healing is the children's bread. And when you read, he sent his word and healed our disease. 
And when you read where he told Moses, none of the afflictions of the world shall come upon you. And when you read in Luke 10, nothing shall by any means harm you. And when you read Philippians, oh, come on somebody. When, when you read that your God took stripes, your G, your Jesus, the Son of God, took stripes on his back for your healing. By his stripes, Isaiah 53, 5, you were healed. When you start saying these things, why did we do these declarations this morning at five minutes to ten? Because we're putting seed out into the air, putting seed into the atmosphere. I'm making a demand on the spirit realm. Why? Because you watch it. When we start doing these declarations, stuff's going to start popping up. Stuff's going to start showing up. That freedom's going to start happening. Miracles going to start happening. Favor's going to start breaking out. The church is going to start multiplying. And you're not going to know why. It's because we begin to put seed out into the atmosphere. I know I've been preaching a long time. Give me five minutes. Somebody shout amen. Tell your neighbor, say, oh, you needed to hear this so bad. Tell them, say, you needed to hear this so bad. Seed, the seed that is sown in their hearts now I was also raised Pentecostal <laughs> Pentecostals do crazy things crazy things Pentecostals will tell you they don't need counseling, they don't need help. Like, I got the Holy Ghost. I don't need that. I need the, I got the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I've seen every Pentecostal thing you could do. Run in the pews. Saw a man run outside and bark up a tree because he was chasing demons up the tree. Yeah, y'all ain't saying nothing. Y'all don't know nothing about my upbringing, I'm telling you. I saw a man who used to walk up and down the altar and his gift was hitting people in the altar in the head with a family Bible. I mean, that family thing on the coffee table nobody ever read at grandma's house. He would bring that thing to church and if you were kneeling at the altar, he would slam you upside your head. The offerings are the best. Because none of them are based in truth. All of them are based in, I've got to get you emotional at that moment. When that is direct opposition to the word of God, the Bible says, let every man give as he pur purposed in his heart. I gave a $1,000 offering to Redemption East this morning before I got here. Why? Because I purposed in my heart. I do not have to wait for you to excite me in a moment. <laughs> it's a purpose. I did it with purpose. I have something I'm sowing for. I have things I'm believing for. I have miracles I want to see. I'm believing things for this. I'm believing things for you. And I had to get some seed out there because the manifestation is in my seed. Now, we get to offering time. And, oh, man. You get the, you, the organ just starts screaming. You know, screaming. And the preachers, I mean, he's all up here and his veins sticking out of his neck. And Take your wallet. Uh, give me something right there. Take your wallet. And throw it on the floor. Yeah. And throw your head back. Hop on one leg to the side. Come around in a circle and rebuke the devil. Say, devil, you can't have my money. And everybody going nuts and they go home just as broke as a hound dog. That ain't done nothing. Good church, nothing will happen in your life because it isn't the key. It's not the access point. The only thing you've got to do is get your, to get your miracles, let the seed hit the soil. You ain't got to dance around it, run around it, circle it. You ain't got to do any of that. The seed's got to hit the soil. Dilemma. When you leave today, the soil is not in your heart. It's in your head. So I might as well take soil and throw it out on the sidewalk. I mean seed and throw it on the sidewalk. Sidewalk is not the landing spot for seed. 
Asphalt is not the landing spot for seed. A plane has a tarmac, a car has a garage. Everything's got to have a place to land. You had that seat, you landed in it. But a seed has to have soil. And without soil, its potential is never realized. If the word of God ever makes it to your heart, what that word of God was sent to do will happen all by itself without an organ or without any preacher getting you hyped up. But when you leave, the word is in your head. You're in you in your mind right now, but it's not in your heart because now we've got something that we've let other religions take away from us that we never do. It's called meditate. I try to meditate at least 10 minutes every morning. It, I, it takes me a long time to read something because I meditate. It takes me forever to read the Bible through. I heard one guy say he read 30 books a year. I might read five. But when I get through with that book, I can stand up here with no notes because I have meditated. And the word meditate means a cow with two stomachs. For those of you who know nothing about cattle, a cattle has two stomachs. And what does it do? We call it a cow chewing cud. It's passing the food back and forth from stomach to stomach during the digestive process until it's ready to be absorbed by the body. Your meditations on the word is when you're passing that thing back and forth between your heart and your head, your heart and your head and your heart and head until it's been absorbed and now it's ready to produce. It is a lost art in the church. I don't ever hear anybody talk about it or preach on it. So the Bible says Satan comes immediately. So if you don't go out and meditate on what I've told you, he knows it's just flopping around up there in your head. So he's got an argument waiting on you. He's going to let your kid say just the right thing to tick you off real good in the parking lot. <laughs> and all of a sudden, all this seed is just... Satan comes immediately. Whew. Didn't even have a chance. Play something if you would. I'm going to quit. I don't normally preach this long anymore. I preach too much to preach this long. But there is something that is about to break out at Redemption East. I'm telling you, it's about to break out. I really need everybody to clap because it's corporate and it's going to hit everybody. It's not going to hit a few. If you can believe it and receive it, I need you to just grab a hold and pop your hands one. Ah. Remain standing if you would. If, you, if you're not standing, would you just stand with me for a moment? You better enjoy not having a service behind you while you can. Because it means you don't have to be in a hurry. The Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. Do you see the dots connecting? Whatever gets in your heart <laughs> manifests. So it says, all your issues out here come from right here. So why am I dealing with this situation? It's because I let the seed of it get in my garden. Well, they're just a sinner. They're just a bad person. No, they are a mixture of seed. <laughs> because they see a great couple, a great man, a great woman of God, and they learn things about marriage. Then they go home and they look at pornography and they get another kind of seed. So they got good seed going in and they got bad seed going in. So what happens? The Bible says, Matthew 25, he got up and he had the tares growing up with the wheat. Good stuff and bad. Everybody in this room, you got some good stuff going on and you got some, the word tares means undesirable. You got some undesirable stuff going on. And all it is is a result of what we let get in our heart. Don't have to be just sin. It can be unforgiveness. It can be hurt, it can be trauma, it can be abuse, it can be betrayal, it can be offense. And all of a sudden your garden is polluted and then your life becomes polluted. Because your life 
is nothing more than an issue that your heart has pushed out. I need you to pray for me, Pastor. I just got all these issues. I need to rebuke the devil, honey. You, <laughs> the devil didn't do it. You didn't guard your garden. Guard your garden with all diligence. Every conversation you listen to, every radio station you play, every thing that you entertain, every environment that you walk into, guard your heart with all diligence. That's why when David messed up with another man's wife and then killed the man, murdered him so he could have his wife, Psalm 51, 10, create in me a clean heart. He said, God, I was where I shouldn't have been, looking at what I shouldn't have looked at, thinking what I shouldn't have thought, started feeling things I shouldn't have felt, and ended up doing something I shouldn't have did. I let it get here, and then it, for out of the heart flow the issue of life. It's the job of the soil to pull the life out of the seed. It's the job of your heart to pull out whatever you put in it. And by the way, soil doesn't care what's dropped in it. Its job is just to produce it. The identity's not in the soil, the identity's in the seed. Are you getting it? So here's how I wanna end. It's been a rough year. It's been a rough two, three, four years for some people. People have been unfollowed don't have anything to do with each other. I, we used to be friends. We used to talk. We used to be connected. We wouldn't, and all this stuff is happening. Do you think that that's not polluting your life? And we got to say, create in me a clean heart. God, take my garden and pull the pollution out of it. And then he said, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. He said, that, that experience I had when I got saved, give it to me again. If you say, Pastor, I just got some stuff that I would love the Lord to just clean out of my garden today. Probably everybody needs to raise your hand, but I'm just going to ask you, how many of you say, I got some stuff. I just, I just need to get it out. I need to get it. It's polluting my life. I got to get it out. Lord, I ask you today that you create in us a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit within us. Cast us not away from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of when we got saved and renew a right spirit within us. The cleansing happens in here. The guarding happens when we leave. So we leave today and we set a guard around our heart that only kingdom seed will enter therein. In Jesus' name. I've gone a long time and you've been gracious. Would you put your hands together and give Jesus praise? Let me bless you. Got a lot of festivities planned for next week. So you need to be here. We put a lot of investment into it. Some great things planned. It's going to be a blast. So bring a friend next week. Raise your hand. Let me bless you before I go. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. May he establish you and give you peace in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Meet a new friend on the way out. I love you.